Hello. This film is part of a series of conversations I'm having with academics from Lancaster University's Department of Politics, Philosophy and Religion. This department has a rich and celebrated history and study of religion. And these conversations are intended to showcase some of the research and expertise found there. You can find more details about the department and the courses they offer via the link below. My name is Benjamin Wood and I'm the subject leader for religious studies at Haslingdon High School, a large and proudly comprehensive school in Lancashire, where I've been teaching GCSE and A-level since 2002. Some of these conversations will be linked to the GCSE and A-level courses, while others will focus more broadly on the study of religion and worldviews. The aim is to provide teachers of all key stages with knowledge that isn't just of interest, but can be of use in the classroom, perhaps by presenting new and contemporary thinkers, or providing new examples and data that can contribute to rich learning in our classrooms. I hope you find that this conversation is both useful and enjoyable. Hello, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gavin Hyman. Uh, Gavin specialises in work on continental philosophy and religious thought, and he has taught and written extensively on the debates between philosophy and theology in the modern and postmodern world, including the cultural philosophical and theological history of atheism and secularism. Hello there, Gavin. Hello, Ben. Very good to have you with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, we're primarily going to focus uh, on an area of some familiarity to uh, particularly A-level teachers, I think, um, but hopefully explore it in a little more detail and, and look at some aspects of it that people might not be so, so familiar with. Um, we're primarily using, if I just might flash that up in front of the screen, uh, this is uh, one of your books, Gavin, A Short History of Atheism, and we're particularly using one of the chapters uh, in this. Um, so what we're going to be looking at uh, is um, some of the issues very familiar in A-level syllabus is to do with uh, religious language, but also to do uh, with areas about the rise of atheism, the rise of secularism. Uh, and exploring some of the connections between those uh, two areas. So both of those are on the uh, the A-level syllabus that I teach for OCR, um, but uh, I haven't always seen the connections, and we're going to explore some of those connections in this conversation. Um, so I wonder whether, Gavin, you could just start as perhaps in that familiar place um, with all A-level courses uh, in the units on religious language will have some work on Aquinas and analogical language. So if you could perhaps just introduce what Aquinas was saying about uh, religious language, and, and in particular, the, the ontology associated with that. Yes, I mean, I think that sometimes the centrality of um, Aquinas's account of language in relation to his overall project uh, is not always as fully appreciated as it could be. It's often seen as just kind of one element among others. But it's interesting that uh, for Aquinas, you know, th this discussion of language uh, comes right at the beginning of the Summa Theologiae or towards the beginning of the Summa Theologiae, his great big, you know, sort of multi-volume systematic work. And it's significant, I think, that, that his discussion does come so early on, because I think Aquinas uh, is well aware that there is uh, a real problem, you know, potential challenge. Uh, how can uh, human beings who are finite, contingent, constrained, um, created by God, uh, how can human beings use language, which is ultimately a, a, human, a human tool, uh, to refer to God at all? Uh, this would seem to be a major question he has to address, because unless he can address that question, the whole of his Summa Theologiae becomes impossible. You know, so, um, and I think particularly in the medieval world, in the pre-modern world, theologians were uh, very conscious of this, of this problem. And you'll see when Aquinas discuss, discusses language, uh, he also engages with other interlocutors, you know, some who said, uh, you can only talk about God negatively, you can only say what God is not, you know, all these kinds of things. So, so this is very much a, a, an, an issue of concern. And what Aquinas tries to do, I mean, he, he, he wants to, he wants to resist that idea that we can only say what God is not. He wants to be able to say something substantive about God, um, but he's also painfully aware that language inevitably falls short, that language inevitably is inadequate. And when Aquinas discusses language, you know, he proceeds 
uh, in that discussion as he does right throughout the Summa through this kind of dialectical um, method, you know, where he puts forward, on the one hand, we might say this uh, and, and puts forward various arguments for that. On the other hand, we might say this and puts forward various arguments for that. And then, of course, he comes for, puts forward his own synthesis, his own answer to the question. And when it comes to uh, religious language, you know, he starts off uh, by saying, well, on the one hand, we might speak of God univocally, where all our language refers uh, in, in a straightforward way, where the language is used of God uh, in the, with the same meaning and the same sense as we use those words as we apply them to things in the world. Uh, and he puts forward various arguments as to why that might be so. Um, but ultimately, the, the problem with univocal language, of course, for Aquinas, is that univocal language um, limits God, contains God within human language, within human concepts, within human long logic. And this ultimately, therefore, um, turns God into something other than God, you know, turns God into a human creation, in fact. Now, the, and then the, so, so he then turns to, on the other hand, we might say that all our language about God is, is equivocal or equivocal, uh, which is to say that when we use our language about God, we use those words uh, in a way where their meaning means something completely different and unrelated to those words as we mean them when we apply them to things in the world. Of course, this has the advantage for Aquinas that it does protect God's transcendence. It doesn't limit God uh, and doesn't contain God within human words. But of course, it has the fatal disadvantage for Aquinas in that it doesn't, really, it doesn't tell us anything. If the words mean something completely different and unrelated, we don't actually know what the words mean when we apply them to God. So that's rejected as well. And so Aquinas comes forward with analogical language as his own attempt to combine uh, the advantages of univocal language with the advantages of equivocal language, whilst uh, avoiding the disadvantage of univocal language and the disadvantage of equivocal language. So Aquinas is very clear, he sees this as a midway, a midpoint, so that our language when used of God uh, analogically uh, is such that the words when we apply them to God are applied in a way that's related to how we, how we use words in the world, but different, related but different. And that's the key thing for Aquinas in his account of analogy. That the, 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 so when we say that God is good or, or has being or um, uh, is, is loving, um, we mean these words in a way that's related to what we mean by good and loving and merciful and being and so on, but also in a way that's significantly different. Uh, and thereby Aquinas is able to uh, provide a model of language that provides some information, provides some substantive content, but also avoids restricting God within human concepts and categories. Um, so that, I think, is, is, is yeah. in a nutshell, his, his account of analogy. And so um, when I teach about Aquinas, we, we, uh, within that idea then of analogical language, so I introduce it to my students as sort of... Um, because I sort of contrast it with this, this problem of maybe anthropomorphizing God and saying, well, Aquinas is careful not to anthropomorphize God because what he does is he provides us through the analogy of proper proportion and the analogy of attribution, uh, a sort of sense of how the analogy works. So to avoid anthropomorphizing God. I wonder if you could just perhaps elaborate on this idea of analogy of proper proportion, because Aquinas very clearly doesn't mean just that God has more love than humans do. He, he, has, he understands it as, as, as in a different way than that. That's right. And that's that's key, I think, to understand. And this go, you know, relates to the question you asked earlier about how this relates to Aquinas' uh, ontology or how he understands God and, 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 God, and God's relationship to ontology. Uh, yes, I mean, what, what Aquinas' account of analogy does uh, guard against is this notion that God has the same kind of quality of uh, characteristics that we have only more of them. You know, that, that what God has is, is a greater quantity uh, of these things, that God is, is good as, as we understand good, but to a greater extent, or God is loving as we understand loving, but to a greater extent. And that of course is not what, what Aquinas has in mind with his account of analogy. Uh, what he's concerned to convey particularly is that God's characteristics are of a different quality to the characteristics as we understand them. They, they're qualitatively different. So it's not just a greater quantity, it's a different quality. Yeah. 
and that is um, you know related then to, to the whole question of the the, the ontological difference. Um, you know that this is, this is uh, important to emphasize as well that for Aquinas there's no kind of there's no kind of continuum of being. Uh, there's no kind of sense in which God is on the same plane, the same level of ontology as we are, but somehow has more being or has greater being. God's quality of being is different. There's a qualitative difference between God's being and our being, um, such that, um, you know, it, it, we, it's, it's difficult to even comprehend what it means to say that God exists, because when we use the word existence, we use the word existence to things as that we know in the creaturely world. We know what it means to say something exists in the creaturely world. But when you actually apply that to God, um, that becomes much more complicated. Uh, for Aquinas, things in the world have existence, whereas God simply is existence. You know, this, this isn't a property that God has that's intrinsic to what God is. And it's very difficult to comprehend that, you know, for human beings who are used to uh, th th these kinds of categories as we understand them in the world. So, yes. I think what is central, you know, and what the, what analogy tries to do is to pay respect to this idea that God has these qualities, God has these features, um, not just uh, just to a greater extent or to a greater quantity, but in an entirely different type of quality. And it's because it's a different quality that we don't know exactly what it is when applied to God, and that's why we have to talk about God analogically in a way that acknowledges that we don't know exactly, we can't specify precisely what these words mean when they are applied to God. Uh, and so that, that sense of respecting the ontological difference yeah. is why for Aquinas, we really do have to you know, use uh, analogical language when we're, when we're talking about God. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of our starting point with, with uh, Aquinas and obviously enormously influential thinker. Um, but I say in, in this, I think it's in chapter four of this, we, you chart an argument that says subsequent thinkers, and you mention a number of them in the chapter, so I don't want to go through all of them, but the, the kind of the evolution of the ideas of people took Aquinas' idea and continued to work with it. You chart an argument that says that the, as, that, as the understanding developed, that actually it's quite fundamentally altered particularly the ontological position that Aquinas was holding. So I wonder if you just sort of briefly chart out, I mean, you, know, you, you talk about John Donne John Don Scottus particularly here and his influence, um, and sort of take us perhaps as far as Kant um, and as sort of as the outworking of, of the progress that you chart um, in that book. Yeah, it's, it's a very long, complicated uh, story. And, um, and even as I even as I kind of describe it in the book, it's it's a very compressed account uh, of what other thinkers have, have analysed you know, at great at great length. Um, one thing that's perhaps I should just mention, Ben, before going on specifically to that, is that um, chapter four uh, of the book is is quite closely related to chapter three as well, because just for people you know for people who've not mm. read the book who don't know the book, just to, just to just to mention this, what I argue, what I argue in chapter three is that when atheism first began to emerge um, and you know, generally acknowledged that in, in Europe it started emerging in the 17th century. Um, what, and then, and then as atheism develops you know, subsequently, what kind of God is, do atheists reject? What, what are atheists denying? And what we find is that um, almost always it's a different kind of God in that modern period when atheism arises, it's a very different kind of God to the God of Aquinas, for instance. Um, now, what we see is that the, the things I was talking about earlier, that ontological difference comes to be lost. Um, God comes to be seen as kind of the biggest being in the world, uh, rather than someone who transcends the world. Uh, there's much more talk about God being within space and time. Uh, there's much more uh, there's, there's even talk about God's body, you know, in, in the 18th century, 17th, 18th century. So that ontological transcendence comes increasingly to be lost. And then, of course, as, as you rightly point out, Ben, in chapter four, what I do is ask, well, how did that shift come about? You know, how did, how did this conception of God get changed as we move from the pre-modern to the modern period? You know, around that time, you know, sort of, if we, if we say roughly speaking, modernity started, 
you know, the, the late 16th century, early 17th century. How was it that that conception of God changed in that period? And then, so what I do in chapter four, as you mentioned, is I, I want to suggest that that change happened not because of, of external reasons, but because of shifts within theology itself. Theology itself uh, began to change how it conceived of God. So it wasn't just that the atheists came up with a different target, uh, theists themselves changed their conception of God. And of course, theists and theologians and, and religious people were themselves part of wider culture, which was itself emerging as modernity at the time. And so in chapter four, what I ask is, well, how, how is it that in theology, how can we see that in theology, uh, this shift started to occur? Um, and so what I do in that chapter then is to trace out some of the thinkers um, as you say, John Duns Scotus is, is one who is often cited here as being of decisive importance. There's been some controversy over that uh, amongst scholars, uh, but certainly Hans von Balthasar, the Swiss theologian I, I draw on quite a bit, uh, some of the contemporary radical orthodoxy so-called theologians like John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock have adopted that Balthasar analysis uh, and say that it was Duns Scotus uh, who really first uh, devised a univocal conception of being, that there is this one univocal sense of being that both God and creatures have, that they both share in, but God to a much greater quantity, going back to the earlier discussion that we had. Um, and so what we find then is that, um, you know, with subsequent thinkers, as we, you know, Don Scotus was quite early, you know, he overlapped with Aquinas, you know, Don Scotus didn't come later in the day, but, but people say that, people see that Duns Scotus, you know, writing shortly after Aquinas, began to prepare the way for the shifts that followed. And although people still continue to say that we must talk about God analogically, uh, as we move into the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, what we find is that they increasingly redefine what analogy is. Uh, they become impatient with obfuscation, they become impatient with mystery, they become impatient with unknowing, uh, and they want more and more to be able to pin things down, to be more precise, to be more definite, to be more certain. And of course, this is where, you know, theology is not connected to its, is not disconnected to its surrounding culture. Yeah. What, that's, what, that's what we see marking modernity. Modernity wants more precision, more certainty, more, more definition, more, uh, and, and it is impatient with unknowing. And so analogy gets more and more and more redefined so that it's rather than being an absolute midpoint between univocal and equivocal language as Aquinas saw it, it actually drifts further and further towards univocal language, uh, drifts further in that direction. Jean-Luc Marion, the French uh, theologian whom I, I quote, speaks about this, this univocist drift that we see in, anal in analogy in the modern period. And again, it's not, a, it's not uh, you know, surprising. Not, this is connected, isn't it, to how the conception of God is changing in that, in that period. Uh, the mystery is, is, is being, um, uh, to some extent, being lost. Um, God is becoming more clearly defined. God is becoming more uh, understandable. Uh, and to use you know, the phrase of, 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 the, of the book by William Pat Patcher, someone who, an American theologian who's done a lot to an analyze this, uh, we see God in the modern, as we go into the modern period, increasingly being domesticated. The transcendence is being downgraded and God becomes increasingly domesticated. Um, and so, you know, as God increasingly becomes a, a kind of a big person, uh, that's perhaps uh, over, uh, over character, uh, over emphasizing it a bit, but certainly that's the direction in which things seem to come. Um, and as, as that happens, uh, of course, that becomes a much easier target for atheists to reject because this God uh, comes to be seen to have all kinds of problems. Yeah, so I guess um, I, 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 the modern God, if we say that, the domesticated God, um, I suppose the, the problem of evil potentially becomes more of a problem if God is in the world and capable of changing things and 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 therefore uh, you know is aware of the world and so on that that re be, remains a thorny issue um, as science explains more as more and more of the mysteries of the universe are explained in non-divine terms then we have a sort of 
that God of the gaps thesis, don't we? we have a shrinking God or a shrinking place for God. Um, and so, yes, but I suppose the ultimate outworking of that would be would be atheism. You've got fertile ground for atheism to be to be seen. Um, which I guess was one of the things Aquinas was trying to was concerned about in his sense, in his sense, his concern about univocal language and where that would take us. And and, and many of the negative theologians uh, have that concern, don't they? Of if, if if we're too prescriptive or something, then um, I use a phrase from uh, Moses Maimonides with my students, uh, who talks about this idea of. Um, he, he argues if you talk about God in affirmative terms, then you're not talking about God at all. You've, you've essentially you've created an idol, uh, a God of your own making, um, and which is what Aquinas was was concerned about. So, but we you can absolutely see the drift and, and why that fits with the, the development of modern thinking. So, you, you, in in the chapter you you talk about sort of can kind of in one sense being the uh, the the kind of outworking of this and, and his idea of the noumenon as a sort of the ultimate outworking of this this drift. Could you just uh, give me a bit on that? Yes, I mean that's one of the things I, I suggest in the in the in the book is what happens when the when Aquinas's ontological distinction gets lost. What happens when God is not seen as being qualitatively other, um, not just not just the biggest thing in this level of existence, but a qualitatively different kind of existence altogether. What happens when that gets lost? Now, what I suggest is that really there are, there are two main responses to this, or two main outworkings of this. Uh, one of them I think we see in Kant. Um, so once you no longer have an ontological difference with an analogical participation between the two levels of ontology, once that goes, um, you then have a, a kind of a, a problem really, because either God then becomes a big person. And I think we kind of see this in the 20th century philosopher of religion, Richard Swinburne, uh, who you know, does explicitly say you know, that, that he defines God as a person without a body. That's the definition that Swinburne uses. Uh, so either you move in that direction, so that God becomes, in effect, a kind of a big person, or otherwise, uh, if if you're not satisfied with that and say, well, that you know that that that's not sufficiently transcendent, well, God can't be can't God can't any longer be transcendent in the old Aquinas sense, the old ontological difference sense. God is now kind of on one plane. Well, how do you respect God's transcendence if it's just on one plane? You've got no option really but to push it further and further and further into the distance further and further away in, so, that, so, that God, so that God becomes ultimately this kind of unknowable abyss. Um, that's what people like Catherine Pickstock and others have suggested, that um, what analogical language does is allow for a participation between these ontological levels. Once that's gone, there's no longer any participation. You know, and all you can do is push God further and further and further away. So God becomes then, if you're going to emphasize the transcendence rather than you know, it's a, a different kind of transcendence now. It's a transcendence on a level, a transcendence on a single level that just pushes God further and further away. And that's what ultimately we find in Kant, isn't it? That, that Kant says that you know, God is, is in the noumenon. God is theoretically unknowable. Uh, all we can do is postulate certain things about God on the basis of reason, what reason dictates. Um, but ultimately, God is this kind of unknowable abyss in the noumenon, completely cut off from any kind of phenomenological manifestation. So those seem to be, you know, the, the two main ways in which uh, God ultimately kind of develops once this ontological difference has been lost. And then, of course, you know, connected to the atheism that you mentioned, you know, th there are two different types of atheism that then result up there, because there's one type of atheism which, you know, finds all kinds of reasons why the big person hypothesis is simply not sustainable. Uh, and there's another kind of atheism that says, well, if God is completely unknowable, why do we need him at all? Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we, atheism can, in its different guises, can accept both of those, uh, both of those different roads in a way, go down. And as, just to focus more on the, um, on the big person idea and particularly how that might be linked with the rise of atheism. 
Um, I wonder if you see a connection with uh, with the likes of Feuerbach and the idea of projection uh, of you know of, of, of human humanity's greatest characteristics and uh, projecting those to to kind of invent a god that's that serves certain uses for us, which again we see then having influence on the likes of Freud um, through into the twentieth century. Do you see? Does, do you see a connection there? Yes, that's right. Um, it's uh, you know because if 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 ultimately, as as we've been saying, what Aquinas was trying to guard against was was turning God into an idol. In other words, turning God uh, into my creation as a human being. Um, then increasingly, if God is conceived as a big person, this is this is kind of what we see starting to happen. That, that what we do is project uh, our own features and characteristics uh, and upscale them. You know, this is, uh, if you look at Hume's dialogues, for instance, the character of Cleanthes, uh, this is very much the kind of thing he has in mind, isn't it, when he uses analogy in a different way, analogy to, to talk about, you know, if we take our own minds uh, as being the kind of the prototype and then we kind of scale up for God, you know, so, that, so there is the sense then that God is, is becoming a big person in that sense. And what, what happens then is what you're doing is you're projecting your own characteristics outwards, which is what Feuerbach does say, isn't he? That's what he says, uh, that, that, uh, that God ultimately is a projection of our own human features outwards. And that's why it's interesting, you know, that um, uh, in some of the recent, you know, some of the English translations of Feuerbach's The Essence of Christianity is prefaced by an essay by Karl Barth, who, 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 you know, the, the, the conservative theologian who thinks that Feuerbach was um, really a genius, you know, because he spotted this. But says, yes, Feuerbach goes to show what happens if you start off with human concepts and human categories and human language and try to project it. Uh, and of course, Bart uh, is much more uh, wanting to uh, instead, instead of starting with human capacities and human reason, he wants to prioritize revelation, you know, rather like, yeah. more like a like Aquinas. So, um, so yeah, I think that um, uh, Karl Barth would say that Feuerbach is simply, you know, simply showing what happens when you use human categories and human concepts and human language and project that and, and think you've reached God, when in fact all you've done is created a big version of yourself. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so if, uh, I mean, well, we got to Barth there, if we move into sort of contemporary scholarship then, so we, we've charted this, this you know, over, over multiple centuries, a sort of a, a drift in thought um, towards university in respect of God. And, and, you've, and you've explained how uh, that analysis could explain the, the rise of atheism or a certain form of atheism, at least. So is there, is there any sort of reaction against this? Is there sort of a, a renaissance of Aquinas in some way or a, or a push for um, a re-emergence of, of analogy, as, as Aquinas meant it, in contemporary scholarship? Yeah, it's, that's a very interesting question. I mean, one thing just to say, uh, first of all, is that uh, although what I argue in, in the book is that, you know, that this is it's an important way of understanding why atheism emerged in the form that it did, because of this changed conception of theism that we find in modernity, um, I wouldn't want to be over reductive or to say that that explains everything you know, that, that, that um, uh, there are undoubtedly other reasons that atheists have for being atheists in addition to that but I think this is an important aspect that's often forgotten you know that atheists often have in mind a god that they're rejecting and then we have to ask well okay is, is where did that god come from and was that god always uh, always the one that Christians believed in so it, it's you know just important to register that um, uh, before going on to the main question. Um, but yes, in terms of the main question, I think one of the one of the mark remarkable things really about the late twentieth century has been uh, a return to Aquinas, uh, precisely as uh, a resource to uh, overcome what is believed to be this unfortunate universis drift. Um, and we see this in you know, diverse theologians, really. Uh, I mentioned, again, I mentioned some of these towards the end of the book, people in the, in the French speaking world, people like Jean-Luc Marion, uh, in the English speaking world, people like uh, John Milbank, um, Fergus Kerr, Rowan Williams. Um, some of the main figures really in, in, in recent theology are, are all very much uh, trying to recover 
uh, an Aquinas-based vision, an Aquinas-based theology. Um, John Milbeck and Catherine Pickstock both wrote a book called Truth in Aquinas uh, around about 2000. Uh, Fergus Kerr has written extensively on Aquinas and uh, Rowan Williams again is known to be very much influenced by Aquinas. So yes, I think that um, this is one of the marked feature I think of uh, post-modern, a certain kind of post-modern theology. Uh, this, this way in which um, a, a kind of postmodern theology that seeks to link hands with the pre-modern uh, over against the modern, you know, that, that um, uh, you know, not, not in the sense of just turning a clock back, but saying that, mm. you know, that there are important things that pre-modern theologians had to say that have been forgotten, and we've forgotten them to our detriment. That's what a, a major kind of strand of contemporary theology would say, I think. Is there any is there any connection with the work of Wittgenstein here in in sense of um, and the idea of Lebensraum and, and and language games and that certain rules belonging to certain types of language? I mean, as I'm not sure of well, I wouldn't say suggest an intentional influence of Wittgenstein, but but that Wittgensteinian analysis has that contributed perhaps to this sort of reemergence of Thomas thinking. I think it's. I think it's very much part of a wider kind of uh, context. Yes, um, I think that if you know, if we look back to the modern period uh, uh, where um, uh, the ontological difference is lost, God is seen much more as a, as a thing or a person or a being, uh, you know, the, the biggest personal being in the world, a big, you know, all of that kind of thing. It often goes hand in hand with the methodology philosophically. Uh, that sees philosophy as being the neutral, objective, universal criterion by which one judges the truth of things, including religion, you know, other things as well. Um, and so we have to establish on rational grounds whether there's a God, um, which is quite different again to what how Aquinas would have conceived things, but that was that was all part of that 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 kind of um, that kind of approach. Now, that's the kind of approach that Wittgenstein questioned, of course. You know, that uh, is there really such a thing as this universal, neutral, objective, rational set of criteria by which we might judge the truth of things? Uh, don't various types of different discourses have their own rationalities? their own logic, their own way of proceeding, their own criteria for what they take to be truth. Um, so the, the, the Wittgenstein, although Wittgenstein himself wasn't um, greatly concerned with religion, um, I think a lot of the theologians that I said have been attracted to Aquinas have just as much been attracted to Wittgenstein because um, what they have been trying to do is to say, well, why does religion have to be answerable to this so-called neutral, objective, scientific rationality. Isn't that simply, in, in Wittgenstein's terms, the elevating of one particular kind of discourse, uh, mainly a kind of empiricist scientific kind of discourse that's, with, that's concerned with empirical things, and then attempting to hold God to that standard, or theology to that standard. And again, you know, the danger then with that is the kind of the danger that Aquinas is trying to guard against by making God or theology answerable to human reason, you know. Um, so uh, what, what Aquinas did in a way was to open up the possibility of saying different discourses have their own logics. Uh, theology itself has its own logic, but doesn't mean that it has to express itself in scientific rational terms, or doesn't have to express itself on a scientific rational foundation. Um, uh, again, you know, that, that would have been as, as wrong for Aquinas as conceiving of God as a big person. Uh, and, and in, in fact, the two things would have been linked. So Aquinas, so sorry, so Wittgenstein really opens the way to appreciating uh, different discourses have different logics. Uh, and therefore to go back and ask, okay, Aquinas didn't justify theology on the basis of neutral objective rationality. Um, he had a different way of proceeding. Uh, a way of proceeding that ultimately prioritized revelation. Uh, and should that necessarily be ruled out of court? If you take Wittgenstein seriously, perhaps it shouldn't. And so Wittgenstein can be seen in that sense as kind of opening a way uh, for a retrieval 
of that kind of Aquinas-based approach, the kind of retrieval that we've seen in, in, more, recent, in more recent theology. Yeah. And just, uh, just another thought, while we, well, it's very interesting what you got to say here. And I, it, one of the things I've found with, with the, the, the other course is that my students, particularly sort of second half of year 13, they really start to make the connections. You know, we do a topic on this and a topic on that, and they can be a little bit atomized. And but what we're trying to do is really start to get them to connect the ideas. So that, but you remember, you know, Kant said this. How does that apply here? Or can you remember? Um, and it occurs to me that so I mean, like like everybody at A level, we'll be we'll be studying the Thomist arguments for the existence of God. Um, and my students are often kind of immediately kind of they're, they're often immediate reaction is yeah but but because aquinas you know let's if we take the first way establishes perhaps the existence of a, of a of an unmoved mover and then says this is god and my students immediately latch on to this is kind of well that's a that's a bit of a jump isn't it that's a bit of a kind of who says it's god who's who's you know where, where's that come from it's sort of it's almost like he's, he's just taking a big leap at the end of the thing and says oh by the way it's god this this unmoved I suppose, I mean, for Aquinas, I mean, that might be kind of the point um, that it does require a leap at the end of it because maybe you've got as far as language and intellect can take you um, in, in respect to the existence of God and therefore and that, and that therefore, there is a matter of a leap of faith if you wish to take it at the end. Um, but I think that point of therefore understanding Aquinas in his own context, that Aquinas isn't writing on using modern standards of uh, proof uh, and empirical reasoning is is talking in a different way, um, and I wonder then whether that, that got them got me thinking of you know we talked about the rise of atheism, but I suppose another uh, interesting phenomenon we've got in the field of religion is is the sort of the rise of I don't know, you know, spirituality, shall we say, the rise of a sort of an, an, a non-institutional version of, uh, and, and it might be characterised by sort of a pick and mix approach to religion. And, um, but that sense that, that kind of the religious instinct or the spiritual instinct within humans isn't, isn't, doesn't seem to be dying out particularly. Um, I wonder whether the sort of, the continued attractiveness of, say, Aquinas' uh, cosmological arguments, that sense of there's got to be something out there that explains all of this sort of thing, even if people aren't Christian about it, whether, whether we've sort of got a reaction against modernity there in some people who are, who are happy to live with that idea of the more a sort of a, a Thomist approach of maybe there's only so far we can go. And after that, we have to maybe step into silence, perhaps. So maybe that that sort of that atheism, that modern form of atheism, that's a rejection of a modern form of God, has in turn then brought about almost a pre-modern idea of God re-emerging. Of that sort of God that's out there and that maybe we don't know very much about. I'm speculating as I'm kind of going along here, just trying to make some interesting connections. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting constellation of things there, Ben. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll try and pick up on, on, on some of them. I mean, I think you're, you're quite right about, you know, uh, Aquinas' arguments, five ways and so on. I mean, there, there, has, there, there has been a temptation to, see, you know, to treat Aquinas as another modern Enlightenment philosopher and think he's, you know, trying to prove the existence of God on the basis of reason. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of work has been done by people like David Burrell and, and William Platcher again, uh, and Fergus Kerr, you know, asking, uh, you know, what is the character of those arguments? Um, Aquinas, of course, does have a high place for reason because he thinks reason is a divine gift. Mm. So, the, you know, the, the, he's not anti-rational by any means, but he's also aware that uh, human reason is, is limited. So, you know, in those five ways, uh, he's trying to show, look, even if you don't, even if you don't accept revelation, which he, of course, does, and, and, and Christians generally do, even if you don't accept revelation, what about even on the basis of reason, you know, will you be led to the idea of God? 
and uh, and through the five ways, you know, he wants to say, well, look, even putting aside revelation, uh, you will come to see that actually uh, the world on its own terms is kind of inexplicable unless you posit uh, an unmoved mover, a first cause, and, hmm. and so on. And as you rightly say, you know that that does you know that that final move, and this is what we call God. Uh, of course, yes, that that for that you need faith. You know, for Aquinas, that's that, there's no doubt about that. You know, you, you can't just you can't just rely on reason alone. Ultimately, you've got to have faith. But his point is that reason can lead you to that faith, which uh, and then you know for Aquinas, it's perfectly perfectly fine for you to be a religious believer without proving it rationally. You know, that was that was no problem. That, yeah. that was the difference with modern philosophers. Yeah. You really you, know, you had to prove it. Whereas Aquinas says, no, you don't have to. But but if if you but if you want to, and you and you're a non-believer, you're trying to persuade a non-believer. Look, reason can lead you so far. So, yeah, I think putting Aquinas into context, what he was trying to do with those arguments, is important. Now, uh, how that connects with um, uh, you know recent moves towards spirituality and and you know certainly uh, uh, others of my colleagues um, i'm sure you, you you will have spoken to some of them that are much more expert on this than i am um how that connects with uh, uh, uh you know is this the, is the pre-modern god somehow kind of returning in some sense um i don't know i mean i think what what we what we do see i think is uh, some of the some of the theologians I was talking about uh, who were returning to Aquinas in some way, you know, that, that, that this is a big theme in recent theology. I think a lot of them would be very skeptical about contemporary spirituality and, and, and this kind of thing, um, because they would see that as being kind of the latest development in modern subjectivity. You know, how, okay. how yeah. That's that, I think that's uh, that would where, that would be where the where the reservations would come in, because I think they would see that as as um, I think part of their diagnosis of the ills of modernity is the way it puts the subject at the center mm -hmm. of everything. Uh, what they're concerned to do is to decenter the subject. Uh, that's that's their motivation really for returning to Aquinas, you know, by putting put, putting the subject into a wider context rather than the subject being absolutely at the center. Yeah. Where, and whereas I think they would be, they would they would have reservations about modern forms of religious spirituality because, um, you know, these are very often called, you know, a spirituality of the self, uh, you know, the turn to the self, uh, this kind of thing. Um, and of course, there's there are disputes I know among sociologists and others as to is that a fair characterization mm. of contemporary spirituality. Um, perhaps, perhaps that's a that's a pejorative way of of, convey, of, of portraying it, you know, saying it, it really is all about cult cultivating a sense of selfhood. Um, but there's certainly a debate to be had there, I think, because certainly some forms of contemporary spirituality, you know, non non religious forms of spirituality are very kind of self oriented, um, and so I think that would be uh, that would be where I think there would be the major divergence. Yeah. In contemporary spirituality and the more pre-modern kind of theistic kind of uh, religious sensibility. Thank you, Gavin. That's, that's very interesting. Um, and, and, uh, as always, it's. I mean, I, I, I find it fascinating to, to delve into as well. But it's. I think it's helping my teaching because. I'm. I'm all of these conversations and the reading. It, it just helps me understand. You know, no idea stands on its own, does it? No, it, they, they come from somewhere, they're influenced by things, and then they influence. And so the, the better I get at understanding that, that I think that's, that follows through into my A-level teaching there, where I'm, uh, even if it's not a specific part of an A-level course, I can just start dropping questions into students. Just, do you notice a similarity? Or do you notice how this might have, just so that there, and that kind of, that sense of learning of that important point of this is how, things move this is how ideas develop because they're influenced by other ideas which in turn are, um, so really really uh, kind of fascinating to um, to hear more about those so thank you very much for your time um sure. excellent excellent conversation so thank you very much kevin my pleasure it's, it's, I, i've enjoyed it then thank you <laughs>